And welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Measuring Work in Single Isolated Cardiomyocytes, Replicating the Cardiac Cycle. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I'll be your host for today's event. Today's session is the seventh installment in our PV Loops to Measure Cardiac Function webinar series. Over the, over the last 12 months, hundreds of scientists from around the globe have taken part in this series and I'm extremely excited to share that today we have over 800 scientists registered. For those of you that are online with us live today, we thank you for taking the time to join us. Our webinar sponsor uh, today is Ion Optics, and together we have worked hard to create what we hope will be received as a compelling and interesting perspective on studying cardiac function at the single cell level. Specifically, we are going to discuss how one can replicate the cardiac cycle in isolated cardiomyocytes through the process of generating work loops. For the PV loop researcher, we believe this will offer a unique perspective to studying function at the cellular level and show parallels to how cardiac function is studied through the generation of load-independent measures that you're familiar with, such as ESPVR, EDPVR, PRSW, and so on. To lead us through today's discussion, we are joined by Dr. Michael Helms. Dr. Helms had an early introduction to studying the mechanical properties of cardiac myocytes during completion of his graduate degree under the mentorship of Hank Grenzier specifically studying the role of Titan. It is soon after completing his PhD that Dr. Helms joined Ion Optics, but over the past 15 years, he has continued to complement his work at Ion Optics with several research positions at academic centers, including Boston University, Maastricht University, and Oxford. Today, Dr. Helms holds the position of Science Director at Ion Optics and combines this with a research position at the VU Medical Center at VU University in Amsterdam. I wish to thank Michael in advance for all his time and effort in preparation for this webinar and of course for being online with us today. Hello everybody, uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning into this webinar. Um, we gave a webinar last year and it was mostly together with Ben Prosser, that was mostly about how would you attach cardiac myocyte, what glue to use, what techniques to use. We talked about how to use a proper forcer as user and we touched on doing work loops. This way it will be, this time it will be turned around. I'll talk a bit about the history, I'll talk a little about the force thresh user, but I'll spend most of my time talking about how do you set up a system to measure PV, to measure force length loops, <coughs> and what you can actually do with those, uh, those loops. Um, to start, I mean we always stand on the shoulders of others, especially in science, and there's a clear beginning point to this story. In 1990 there was a group in Tours, France, of Garnier, and Le Gonec was his PhD student, and he published a paper where he showed that if you had specific carbon fibers, you could grab an intact cardiac myocyte and you could stretch it, and you could measure force just by looking at the bending of the fibers. For actual traces, you can see the length dependent activation, but the forces are really, really low for people who have actually done these type of experiments. So, but it was a great starting point. Several people over the years picked up this technique. There was a group in Japan. Yasuda, who developed their own source of carbon fibers and they started to do experiments and published it in 2001 for the first time and the most important paper in 2004. And they were the first one to actually attempt to control force. They did, they did it using a feed forward technique. They essentially recorded a force transient and then played it back to the motor but in reverse order so it would counter the contraction and that way, depending on how much you have amplified it, you would you would get more or less isometric or isotonic contractions and by combining a few elements they could even create loops. Um, the work from Le Guernac was picked up in England, Ed White published with it, it ended up in the laboratory of Peter Cole and in the summer of 2005 I went to the laboratory of Peter Cole to work together with his PhD student at the time, Gentaro Ariba, to further this technique. We improved the attachment also using feed forward, we figured out how, how to manipulate force and it was quite successful. We managed to take our transients and sometimes control force by having an isometric contraction where lengths didn't change. We had high force developments, uh, isotonic contractions where force didn't change at all and we actually managed to do work loops. Um, this shows you an example where for the first time we show how you can have different uh, preloads you get your end-diastolic force length relation and you get your end-systolic force length relation. Again, at this point, we were doing feed forward. Let me spend a few words on the difference between feed forward and feed back. Feed forward is when you more or less know what is going to happen. 
that's clearly the case in, with cardiac myocytes. Every contraction is more or less the same. So using information from the past, an average contraction, you can counter the next contraction by sending a signal to your motor. It works great. It's not very demanding of the speed of your system. The downside is you cannot very well anticipate on changes. And after all, that's what we are after. With the work loops, we want to perturb the system to see how it changes. And that is actually really hard to do with feed forward. It's much better to do with feed back, uh, where you have a set point, force that you want to clamp, and as soon as you get a deviation, you send a signal to the motor to correct for it. This, however, puts a pretty high demand on your data rate, because you need to be able to interact between the motor and the force fast enough. And as we were measuring fiber bending, we could measure the bending, but it was updated at video rate, and it was not nearly fast enough to ever do feedback, so we were stuck with feed forward, so, as with the Japanese group. That's about as much as we could get out of a system with feed forward, the loops which I just showed you. Let's see at the end of the road of it. Well, whatever it did, it did set up a collaboration with a group of John Letterer in, in Baltimore. Gentaro went there a couple of times with the Maya stretcher, as we called it, in his uh, suitcase. They started to do experiments where they would look at uh, calcium sparks when stretching cells. In the Letterer group, they were not all that impressed with uh, the attachment strength of the carbon fibers, and they set out to develop uh, a glue for myocytes, and they called it Myotac. They published it in a beautiful science paper in 2011, and the Myotac essentially mimics extracellular matrix material, collagen, laminin, and the likes. Uh, and it also spells cells pretty well, and the jumping attachment force was made of a few <laughs> increased by a few factors. Um, this generated a lot of excitement. While we had a made a mice stretcher system in the past for Peter Cole, we didn't really we didn't really advertise because it was hard to use. We replicated it for a few laboratories, but now that the Myotech was available, we decided to upgrade the mice stretcher system. So this technique would come within reach of many researchers. This is what it looks like. People who have seen the different systems will recognize the contributions of the Peter Cole lab. They'll recognize the enhancement that Chris Ward made. And there's of course the inoptic sauce over it. We made of our own innovations. Um, you have a 3D manipulator to grab the cells, arms that extend to the chamber, and the rails so you can move, easily move them in and out of the way. We wanted to do force clamps, but still, we were stuck with using video to measure the force. And the data rate is just too slow. So we tried to attempt this with, uh, with force transducers, but force transducers had just been developed for higher forces, and they were not good enough to be able to do this work. I mean, this shows the best example of what we had been able to achieve, and it's a nice signal, but it's not good enough and not fast enough for feedback work. You can make them more sensitive, but then you run into troubles with stability. Um, it just wasn't going to work, so we had to come up with something better, and we ended up, together with the physics department at the Fu University in Amsterdam, we developed our own force transducer. The biggest problem with stable measurements is actually the air-water interface. So we wanted to have a force transducer that was fully submersible. So we ended up, to go, ended up going for an optical transducer. So what you see here, it is the block that uh, forms the, the actual transducer with this cantilever. It's about three millimeters by three millimeters square. This is optical fiber, and what we actually do is we measure the distance between the optical fiber and the, and the cantilever here and we use laser interferometry to do so. And we can do this with nanometer precision. So we get a very, very sensitive force transducer, and the sensitivity depends on the stiffness of this fiber, which we can manipulate. Because it's so small, it has a high resonance frequency, which means it's very, very responsive, about eight kilohertz. Um, and it's stable, again, because it's fully submersed. So now we finally have an excellent force transducer to be able to do these uh, measurements. Uh, this is a raw force, raw unfiltered uh, force trace. This is about an amplitude of 0.2 micronewton. This is probably closer to one micronewton. Uh, and as you can see, the signal to noise is excellent. This is what it looks like on the microscope. Here we have an arm with a piezo motor. Here you have an arm that on the very tip has the force probe. This is the close-up, the force probe with a needle to which we attach the cell, and a needle on the other side that is attached to the motor. And now we have most of the components in place. We have MyTech for good cell attachment. We have the mechanics to pick up the myocyte. We have a good force transducer 
what is still lacking to be able to do force control. We needed hard and software so the force transducer can talk to the piezo motor. I mean, you can only modulate force of the myocyte by changing its length. You stretch it, the force gets higher, you release it, the force gets lower. That's true in diastole and that's true in systole. We made the first uh, system in LabVIEW because that's the easiest way to get a prototype going. And we made an algorithm that more or less mimics the cardiac cycle that uh, we can execute with hard and software. You're all familiar with the cardiac cycle, but let's quickly run through a loop. This is just a model. The left ventricle, the aortic valve, the mitral valve. You start at the end of diastole with the pressures here in millimeters mercury. The mitral valve is open, the aortic valve is closed. Then the contraction starts, pressure starts to increase, increase. the mitral valve closes, the force goes up. But since the aortic valve is closed, the volume doesn't change. The force gets high enough, you start emptying your ventricle into the aorta. Pressure stays more or less the same the volume gets reduced. Till the end of systole, the, mitral valve, the aortic valve shuts, the pressure drops isovolumically till you get below the pressure in the atria, the mitral valve opens and it fills again. It's a PV loop but also a work loop. Work is change in force times change in, ch change in length or in this case pressure times volume and the area in this loop represents the amount of work that the heart is doing on the blood. We can do a very similar thing with cells. So here you see a cell attached to two glass rods. We start, the cell is in this long and diastolic position. When the force is higher than the preload, by the way, I use the words preload and afterload a lot and they have a meaning in a whole heart physiology where preload stands for the volume at the end of distally or interchangeably the pressure at the end of distally and the afterload stands for the pressure in the aorta. Here I use it to indicate the force we clamp at in diastole, the preload, and the force we clamp at in systole, the afterload. So the force starts to rise, but nothing happens yet, till we cross uh, our preset afterload, and then we start to shorten the cell to try to keep the force level. If the contraction nears its end, the force drops below the afterload level, we stop controlling, until it drops between the preload level and we stretch the cell to try to keep the force constant until the next uh, contraction. Does it work? More or less. Here we see a force trace from a mouse myocyte. Here's the end of diastole, the pacing, the pacing pulse. The force rises, we don't do anything until we hit the afterload level and then we start to shorten. The cell relaxes, we stop controlling and as soon as it drops below the preload, we start to stretch it again and you get our loop. This is at room temperature and you can already see and this is about the best loop that we got after a number of tries. And you see we, can st we still have significant overshoot, a significant undershoot, which is not that bad except this is room temperature. If everything gets 10 times faster at 37 degrees, we'd be completely lost. Huh? So we, got, we had to go back to the drawing board. This all doesn't change, but we had to get lighter mechanics so the piezo could move, move things faster. We decided to go to a direct drive piezo instead of the actuator that they had, so, they had no, so we had no time lag in it starting to move, and it was just faster. And every millisecond counts in this case. Force reducer is still the same. Hard and software, left view wasn't going to cut it. The maximum we could run the iteration loop at properly was a few hundred hertz, and that's just not fast enough. Instead, we started to use what's called a FPGA, which is an embedded chip that can take pretty complicated protocols, but it's designed for real-time control. So you can run the, the loop that does your feedback at pretty much unlimited speed. And we improved the algorithm slightly. I mean, people pointed out to us that we had to have a proper physiologic ending to systole. That's what we implemented. So this is what the new loops look like. It's still at room temperature. Here we have our isometric contraction. Here we do the force control and you see we clamp it much better now. Now the end of systole, you know in the heart, when the pressure drops and the blood starts to flow back, it closes the valve. What do we do here? We shorten and shorten and shorten to keep the force level and as soon as the force drops and the motor reverses position to stretch the cell to keep the cell the force up, that's when we enter this phase of the loop and we go to the isometric phase. This is what you get. You get a nice square loop. And I know in biology things are not square. 
we don't take things into account like arterial resistance. There's a lot of room for improvement, and we can we can build on what people have done in the past with Trebekele, the likes of Westerhoven Helsinga, Hengter Kurs, uh, Loiselle in New Zealand. Uh, but at this point in time, what was most important for us that we had something simple that we could understand. This is something we could do now, where we sit at the preload. We have an almost isometric contraction. We slowly increase the afterload, and you see that the loops get taller and taller and taller. And if you plot the work, the area in this loop for each contraction, this is the isotonic end, and you nicely move through a maximum and down again to the eventually for an isometric contraction, you'll be at zero. It's great, but at this point, I literally had a box that had a knob that said preload and a knob that said afterload, and I had to turn the afterload knob to get this. That's, of course, not a great way to get. Uh, reproducible experiments. So we went back to the drawing board once more, and we decided that for the flow of the experiment we had to automatically set the pre and afterload levels based on a force transient so that it wouldn't take as much time. And we needed to be able to program in changes in the pre and afterload. So, and lastly, we needed temperature control because we did want to go at 37 degrees. Well, this is an example of a fairly recent uh, cell where you see here. This is force, this is length. Here we step up to preload and then keep it constant. And then we gradually change the afterload and back. We step up to preload again, gradually change the afterload, and the correction signal to clamp is course according. You see here we have to do hardly any control. Of course we're almost at isometric. We have to do a lot of control because we must close to isotonic. We have to make a big length change. <coughs> Excuse me. What does it look like? I'll show you a recording at uh, 2 Hz. The cell is being paced at 2 Hz. You see the oscilloscope view. You see the force here and the length here. You see we're increasing the afterload each contraction. Here we increase the preload and then we increase the afterload again. And here you see the corresponding loops that get taller and taller and taller. To make the switch to a new preload, the loops get bigger length-dependent activation, the Frank Starling effect, and as we increase the afterload, it gets shallower and shallower again, and this gets repeated one more time. <coughs> so we step in total through four different uh, preloads. Just to show to you again so you can think about it a bit more, here's where we increase the pacing frequency, same thing, but now we pace it at 4 hertz. Again, force, length, so we control force by changing length. Forces are independent variable, lengths are dependent variable. One more time, but now at 8 hertz, you see, speed is not really an issue here anymore. We have a slightly different protocol again where we increase and then slowly decrease the afterload. If you observe this closely, you'll see there is hysteresis, and there is. That's how you can do it. You can quickly cycle through different frequencies. Everything is set up. You finish one frequency, you set up the next frequency, and off you go. This is the kind of figure that you can get. Here we show three different afterlo afterloads. The black line is actually this particular loop. Unless you drop the afterload, you need to do more and more correction in your length signal. This shows you the anti-stolic length that we get to, and this is fairly typical. Um, about the maximum uh, anti-stolic length we get to is 2.1, and I'll get back to that later. People are familiar with um, PV loops and the anti-stolic pressure volume relation and diastolic pressure volume relation. Well, see straight away, we have a very shallow anti-stolic loop. There's a reason for that. It's kind of an artifact because we have a very compliant connection. We use a lot of MyAttack because the cell seems to be really happy in it, lots of extracellular matrix. The downside is that a lot of the length change is soaked up in the MyAttack. Um, um, it's a limitation, but it turns out it's very reproducible, so you can work with it. You still find difference in your end-systolic force length relation. So to summarize it so far, measurements on Lodomyocytes have come a long ways. Uh, the, the real thing that triggered this 
robust ability to measure force accurately and fast and stable with a new type of force thrust user. That is really the centerpiece of this system. And then we have used it to develop a system that we can now reproducibly measure work loops in cardiac myocytes. We mimic the cardiac cycle, we do it in a simplistic way and fully open to suggestions how to improve it. Um, and we can vary the preload and afterload at will. Of course, it's a work in progress, so there's many issues remaining. As I said, a work loop is not a PV loop. We do need more sophisticated algorithms, um, but the infrastructure is in place. I mean, we have a programmable chip, whatever algorithm we throw at it, it can probably take it. Um, I've talked about force, I've not talked about stress, which is probably something that you're very interested in. On the microscope that I have, measuring cross-sectional area, area reliably is pretty tricky. I can measure the width of the cell, but not the depth of the cell. So I have to estimate the cross-sectional area, and there's a fair bit of error in that. People on confocal microscopes don't have this problem because they could do a C-stack, but it is a problem that needs to be solved for standard microscopes. As I alluded to before, compliance in the attachment of the cell is a problem. <coughs> Sorry, someone tried to enter the room, so I had to wave them away. Um, compliance in the attachment of the cell is a problem because it does limit the usefulness of the endostolic and systolic force length relation, but you can work around that. Um, and I'll show you in the next few slides how we actually deal with it. Uh, we're working on a solution to this problem. And then the eternal question, do we cover the physiological sarcomelian length range? I think we mostly do, because we can measure sarcoma length of up to 2.1 micrometers. Uh, but some people would argue that we still have to go higher, but if we improve the attachment of the myocyte, we can solve that problem as well. I said in the previous slide that we were going to do something about the cell attachment. This is what we have been doing. We find a way to laser etch tiny glass slides, where we can make a shape that fits the myocyte. The diameter of this is about 30 microns. And here shows you, this, this shows you side view. This is the holder, and this is the myocyte that needs to fit, needs to fit in, this, uh, in this hollow. This is a bottom view. And you see, compared to the previous glass fiber, we now cover a huge amount of area of the myocyte, so we will get much better attachment. Um, this shows you an example where, we, uh, where it is being stretched. What does it look like? If you look in the 3D, or this one, a similar thing. You see they quite snugly fit into the, into the, 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 the shape we etched into the glass. Uh, of course, if you have hypertrophied myocytes, it needs to be bigger, but it's something we can do. And Prosser has almost been exclusively, is exclusively using these holders now, and he's the one who is most experienced with it. I still have to apply it in my system, but he says it works very well it follows stretch much better, and he gets to measure much higher sarcoma length. So, so we have high hopes for this in the future. This actually shows you some data from this, where he steps up the length, and you see how the sarcoma length follows very closely. This is, of course, a passive cell and not an active cell, but he says he easily gets into uh, 70 to 80% of his cells now to sarcoma length of 2.2. Uh, this shows you the accompanying, accompanying passive forces. All right, so far I've only talked about how we can do it, but why would you actually want to do work loops on single cells? I mean, initially when I started, it was, it was a bit of a gimmick. Uh, it was a cool thing to do. But people were also asking for it, and there was a reason for it. My sites are much more accessible than trabeculae. What do I mean by that? It's easy to use. I mean, some people are very good at dissecting ultra-thin trabeculae, but it's not that many. Cells, in a couple of days you can learn how to stick them. And you can do many more in a day while only sacrificing one animal. Some people would say it's an advantage to not have any extracellular matrix left. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a pro or a con because you also take the cells out of the natural habitat, but it depends, I guess, on the question you want to, yeah, to, to ask. The main thing that people get excited about is the ability to stretch cells and monitor inside the cells what is happening using imaging techniques, for example, or perfusing drugs. Uh, for people who do know the science paper of Ben Prosser and his subsequent papers, he used it to look at the calcium sparks or ROS production while stretching the cell. So you can ask very detailed scientific questions and actually see what is happening and measure what is happening on the contractor level. 
after I started working with work loops, what I discovered that they're actually most useful in detecting changes in diastolic properties of the cell. And that's still a big area. Diastolic function is one of the research questions people still have a hard time uh, researching. And I'll try to explain why it's good at looking at diastolic properties by sharing some of our experimental results. Um, the first example is both rest potentiation. That's an experiment that probably most of you are familiar with. If you paste the cell rapidly, and then you pause it, and you paste it again. So essentially, for going from 8 hertz to 4 hertz, this is post rest potentiation. What happens? It has a diastolic component and a systolic component. The systolic component is because you've been pasting it rapidly, you have been loading the sarcoplasmatic reticulum. And when you wait for a bit and then you give a pace and all that calcium is released in the cytosol, you get a really strong contraction. But similarly, because you have a much longer diastolic period, more calcium is being taken up. So the cell relaxes better compared to the rapid pacing. Now, if you're a constant length, you see here there's the length signal and it doesn't change. What you see predominantly is a systolic effect. So we pause here and we get a much stronger systolic contraction than we had before. There should be a drop in diastolic force as well. I just can't see it. You have to really zoom in to be able to see it. So you see it a little bit in the sarcoma length. So you get a minor increase in length, but not much. Uh, you mostly see the strong contraction because more calcium gets added to the system. Uh, now, if instead you control force, so here we're measuring work loops, and we're keeping the systolic and the diastolic force constant. Not quite because of the strong contraction. We get more of an overshoot and an undershoot than we had before. That's just what it is. But if you look at the sarcoma length, you can now very clearly see that as soon as we stop pacing at 8 hertz, there's a relaxation of the cell. It lengthens. Uh, why is that? Calcium is taken up. The cell relaxes it. It gets less stiff. But we're still pulling at it with the same force. So we will stretch the cell. So for the next contraction, not only do you have all the extra calcium, you're also at long, longer lengths now. So you you add with length-dependent activation, so you get a really strong subsequent contraction. What does it look like when you do work loops? It's the same data trace. It's happily patterning away at 8 hertz. Then we stop and boom, you get huge contractions. Uh, I'd say that the, the work being done by the cell, switching from 8 hertz, hertz all of a sudden to 1 hertz, it increases 5, 6 fold. So what is actually happening? Let's graph it out. So here we have our end systolic force length relation. Here we have our end diastolic force length relation. I know that is, according to the literature, this is not supposed to be linear. It's supposed to be curvilinear. But if you measure single cells, it is linear for the range that we measure. I can't really change that. And it makes drawing much easier. So what would happen if you would do the equivalent isometric contraction? Where the same anti-stolic force, and you get a strong contraction to this point where you would get on the anti-stolic force length relation. What happens now if we do post rest potentiation? This is the systolic effect, much more calcium in the next beat, and this is the diastolic effect. At the end of diastole, much more calcium is being taken up. What is the effect on work? You have a strong systolic component and a strong diastolic component. What would happen if you would do the same measurement isometrically? You would still see a huge increase in your systolic component. You'd only see a minor decrease in your diastolic component. Isometric contractions really underestimate the diastolic contribution in, uh, in the, force the force development. Here's another example. These are all data. I showed these as well in uh, the webinar last, year, webinar last year, but they're still they still have a point. So I had cells, and they were in pretty bad shape. They were calcium overloaded, and they could not stretch into very long lengths. So I decided, well, why not add a little bit of uh, BDM? BDM is a known inhibitor of cross bridges, so I figured it would relax the cell, and maybe it could stretch them a little bit longer. What I had not anticipated is, as soon as I would do this, I would get a huge increase in the amount of work per beat. So what happens? The end systolic force length relation goes down, as you would expect, with uh, cross press inhibition, but clearly I had enough residual active force left in diastole that my end diastolic force length relation went down as well. You can see that if you look at the force and the length traces. So force 
well, you can't see that much in force because I keep the force constant. I have a constant anti-solid force and a constant anti-systolic force. You only see the switching artifact here. So here we switch, then it takes four or five beats to get to the cell, and as soon as it hits the cell, the cell starts to lengthen. Again, there's a residual force, we inhibit those cross bridges, the force drops, but we still pull at it with the same force, so the cell gets stretched. And clearly, the length-dependent activation beats out the diminished cross bridge, uh, the cross bridge inhibition by the BDM. If we go graph it out again, what do we see? Here's antisystolic force length and diastolic force length. This is just to remind you what it looked like. Here's the work that is being done. This will be the equivalent isometric contraction. And diastolic force, systolic force. Now we add BDM and systolic force, and systolic force length relation goes down. Reduce anotropy by inhibiting cross bridges, but similarly the end diastolic force length relation goes down. What would happen if you would look at the isometric contraction? You get a big drop in systolic force. Well, you add a little bit to the amplitude by going down in, di in diastolic force. But if you look at this, you would say, well, the amplitude of my force development is down. Decreased performance. If you look at this, Yes, you lose some in the systolic part, but you gain much more on the diastolic part. Hey, the perspective is different. If you do force control, you would say with the same experiment, we have actually improved performance. Let's switch gears a little bit and look at another reason to do work loops. Um, as I shown in the previous slide, if you do work loops, work if you look at the work done by a myocyte, you encompass both the systolic changes the diastolic changes, but you also take length dependent activation into account. And those combined means that the effect is much bigger than when you would look just at one of the components. If people look at post rest potentiation, they would usually would expect a 50, maybe 100% decrease in force. We had a five to six fold decrease, increase in the amount of work being done. So along similar lines, I think this makes it for a sensitive assay to test the effect of drugs. I'll show you one example. And well, isoproteranol, of course you will get an effect with uh, strong beta adrenergic stimulation, um, but I'll show you how it achieves that effect. So the effect is about a two to four or five fold increase in the work uh, that is being done per loop. We did this for a number of cells, this is just one example. So how did we construct this figure? Both figures we went to four different preload levels and for each preload level we looked at what the maximum amount of work was that can be done. I showed this before when we're still working at room temperature. This is an example where we change, just change the afterload. You see you nicely go through a, a parabolic curve and you can find the peak. Why is that? If you do an isotonic contraction, you don't do any work. You change length, but you don't change force. If you do an isometric contraction, again, you don't do work. You change the force, but there's no length change, and the definition of work is change in force times the change in length, carry in the loop. So somewhere here, there's an afterload where you get the maximum amount of work. We don't always catch it, but usually we manage to catch the peak and we manage to find the maximum amount of work that the cell can do at that preload. Why is that useful? In this case with isoproteranol, um, we want to do a repeated measure, but unlike the, the BDM experiment, we couldn't perfuse it directly on the cell for reasons that I won't get into. So there was about five minutes in between where we started to infuse diisoproteranol and we could do our measurements. And unfortunately, the suture is pretty stable, but not that stable that you can maintain the exact same pre and afterload for all that time. So we have to start again. And this is a good way to arrive at the same point. Um, but there's another reason to, another reason to, reason to do so. Again, similar graph, and diastolic force lengths and systolic force lengths. We determine the point, the afterload point where we do the maximum amount of work. Here we have our isometric contraction. We add ISO, and diastolic force length relation goes down, as you'd expect, based on the literature. This is something that you see in a whole heart that you often don't see in trabeculae. But you clearly see it in a, when you do work loops on a single mice, that you see that the end-diastolic force length relation is more shallow than it was in the control. Anyway, so now we have a much bigger loop if you don't change the pre and the afterload with a big systolic component and a sizable diastolic component. And here is the increase 
you get a isometric contraction. But what if for this new this new situation we again determine the maximum amount of work that can be done with the optimal afterload. And if you do that, you see you get a very big loop. Instead of doubling the amount of work, we now quadruple the amount of work um, compared to only a 50 or 50 to 100 percent increase you would see in a, in a muscle strip with isometric contraction. Um, why is that important? It improves the signal to noise ratio. And if you improve the signal, uh, signal to noise ratio from your experiment, you increase the statistical power of your, power of your experiment. So you get a bigger difference. Uh, so you have a higher chance of finding what is really happening. Uh, and I think this is going to be important for that as well. Uh, so, workload measurements lend themselves well to establish the maximum amount of work a cell can produce. Like in the previous webinar, I, I showed you how much power a cell could produce, what the maximum frequency was it could produce the power. Here I show how it is useful to measure uh, the effect of drugs on changes in inotropy. Uh, it highlights changes in both diastolic function and dysfunction, and I think it's going to be a good tool in finding drug effects uh, because it looks at both systolic and the diastolic effects. What's next? I mean, the work is never over. We'll uh, have to do further methodological improvements mostly reducing end compliance, and the cell holders seem to be a good step in the right direction. And of course, there's always further research. I think it's going to be particularly interesting to look at calcium sensitizers and desensitizers in disease models, and maybe look at how you can combine the two to achieve the maximum effect. The NREP effect is another candidate. It would be very nice to study with a mice side that is very accessible. Um, and everybody can, can make up their own pet project to guess on what to study with these work loops. I'd like to acknowledge the people who have worked with, RF, a PhD student in the lab of Yolanda, who did most of the experiments, Yolanda van der Velde, who gave me the opportunity to work in, uh, in this group, um, Tom Udell at Iron Optics, who is a very good engineer and came up with most of the technical innovations and also designed the cell holders. Uh, and we would never have been able to properly do work loops without the FPGA programming. We have a very good specialist in LX. Uh, and of course, as many other people who contributed. Um, I would like to, fer like to thank you very much for listening, and uh, I think it is time for uh, Q&A. Okay, now, first question. Uh, the compliance results in the end systolic force length relation, um, you mentioned that they're shallow. Um, ultimately, why is this? And then also, is, is this somewhat limiting uh, for the researcher? Can I take this question? Uh, yes. What happens? We use a lot of my tech, so when you do a micro stretch, especially at your longer lengths and high forces, more than 50% gets taken up by the by the my tech, and the rest is used for stretching the cell. So you're you're underestimating how much the cell is actually being stretched. Um, it's not a showstopper. I mean, it's unfortunate, and that's why we try to work on it. But if you if you glue your cells consistently, the same thing will happen every time. So it's a systematic error. You can get around it, and you can still find differences doing so. If you actually look at the sarcoma length at diastole and systole, you see actually there is a proper relation with a very high ratio between the end systolic sarcoma length and the end diastolic force, force sarcoma length relation. Um, but there are some issues with end systolic sarcoma length that I won't get into here, but that's why I haven't been showing these graphs because it would be a bit misleading maybe, uh, although it would, would have looked good. Uh, next question, please. Uh, sure. Um, okay, so how about during force development? Um, the measurements are supposed to be isometric, but it looks like the cell sarcomere length is shortening. Why is that? It's for the same reason, because you have a compliant uh, connection, so you get internal shortening. This is nothing new. People with trabecular have had trouble with that for years and tried also for years to fix that. Um, Funny enough, I don't think it matters. Um, when you look at end systolic sarcoma length correlates very poorly with the developed force we have found out. In red mice sites at 37 degrees, the, 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 the curve seems to be entirely dominated by the, the length dependent activation seems to be entirely dominated by the end diastolic sarcoma length and not end systolic sarcoma length. Uh, so although yeah, it, it is an issue to be aware of, it doesn't prevent you from doing very useful experiments. Uh, Okay. Just to reiterate that, Michael, you mentioned how as long as you're consistent in applying the my attack, then it essentially yeah, becomes a constant. 
um, I think that's, a, that's an important point to make. So you can still compare animal models if that's what, what, what you're trying to get at here. Right? Okay. So, and yeah, and kind of on the note, Joe, that you bring up about attachment points, we've had uh, some questions come in about that. Carrie actually asks about the use of myotac. So just, are there any best practices um, uh, for myotac that we can rehash? I know you covered this in your first webinar, so perhaps maybe that's the first resource if oh. for anyone who's more interested, check that out. Um, and the papers by Prosser, but what can you share with us now online about best practices with using myotac coding and getting a secure um, attachment? Co coding is all important. There is no golden rule. The, what, what, what happens is you have to do a decent pre-code, so you have a rough surface on your cell, and then you have to get a decent amount of myotac that you don't let cure too long, not too short, but there is no perfect answer because the climate in every laboratory is different. I mean, in Arizona, I did it in Hank's lab, you have tens of seconds before your myotech is almost evaporated and it gels. Mm. When it's cold and you have high humidity, it can take five minutes. Uh, so th there hardly is a best practice. Now, you, you'll find your best practice for the experiment you want to do. If, want to minimize the, if I want to minimize the compliance, I use very little myotech, but the result is I lose a fair number of cells. If I want to do a really long experiment where I want to use the cells for an hour or more, I use a lot of myotech so the cell is practically swimming in it and it makes it very happy. Unless you do very crazy things with it, it'll stay healthy and beating pretty much at the same force for an hour or an hour and a half, if you will, uh, because it's in, it's in the environment that it wants to be in an extracellular matrix. Um, okay. So there's no best practice. You have to feel your way through it and you, if you do a lot of experiments, you 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 you'll find what suits your experiments. Now, what is important is that the myotech is still of good quality. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And again, how often you thaw and refreeze your myotech, I can get away with it a lot. It's very humid in the Netherlands, and it never gets very hot, so it doesn't degrade very quickly. Yeah? We had people in China to complain that. Um, that they can, after, after, after freezing and re-thawing it two or three times, uh, it's not sticky anymore. And the same thing if you store it in, uh, in the laboratory, uh, clearly uh, having a lab at 30 Celsius uh, with almost 100% humidity uh, is not very good for keeping the quality of your myotech. Uh, so you have to, when you get fresh myotech, uh, you have to kind of get a sense for how well it sticks then. Okay. You have to have a sense how and when it degrades and adjust your practice to it. Uh, it's the reason why we deliver many small files, uh, so you don't have to waste everything in one shot, uh, and you can open a new file every week without it uh, crippling you financially. Right. So it's definitely a discovery process depending on um, the research objectives, but also, as you say, the environment. Um, okay. Uh, well, then, I guess on the same uh, topic of attachment, you, you know, you've introduced the cell attachment holders that um, uh, Ben Prosser's been working with extensively. I know this is a new thing, or you've mentioned this, but again, what can you, um, you know, can you share any other details again about how that brings us up to another level of maybe consistency and accuracy on cell attachment? And um... Well, in the end, the amount of force you can apply to uh, to a my side depends on how good the connection is. Mm -hmm. And if you quadruple the attachment area, the area between, the, the bonding area between the myotech and the cell itself, you will also quadruple the amount of force it can hold. Uh, and similarly, you, 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 you'll you get less slippage because you have a, you have a much, you have a much bigger band holding it in place. It will still be elastic, but if it's very hard to stretch, you won't notice it anymore. Huh? Okay. It's important to note as well, with the uh, cell holders, you run the risk of actually uh, filling the, the cavity with pre-coat. Um, so there are some differences between using the, the straight rods and the, and the cell holders. Um, but, you know, we're still sort of working through all that. Uh, what would be really nice and what Ben actually asked us for um, is if we could uh, coarsen the, the surface so that the pre-coat wasn't even necessary. Mm. Um, and that's something we've considered, but it's, uh, we don't actually make the cell holders. We design them and send them out to be laser etched. So there's the limitations to how much we can actually do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but I guess, uh, so this is a, yeah, this is an ongoing innovation and um, you go, obviously, we'll be keeping uh, your researchers and your users up to speed on those changes, so um, very good. Hopefully that addresses some of your questions, Carrie. Thank you for sending those in. Um, let's change gears a bit. Um, 
how about um, uh, you know, Michael? You talk about uh, uh, setting preload and afterload as it relates to you know, generating work, work loops, and you, you you know you touched on this just briefly in the middle of your presentation. But you know, how specifically, how would a researcher determine, or again, is there a best practice or a rationale to which preloads and afterloads they should use for a particular experiment? It's hard to give absolute numbers because that, of course, totally depends on uh, how much force you generate. And when you start doing work loops, the first rule of thumb is your signal to noise should be good enough so you can actually do force clamping. And once you have that, you look at the, the amplitude of your force signal and you base your pre and afterload on that. Uh, I mean, my standard numbers are that once I start, I, I add, so I take the, the amplitude of my force transient, I add 10% of that to the baseline for my starting preload, so it will stretch it a little bit, so I know that I have a good contraction and maybe 45% 40, of the, the amplitude of my contraction for the afterload, so it does a decent amount of clamping. If I really want to start close to isotonic, I make the afterload and preload equal. If not, then I put them a little bit further apart. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it just depends what you, what you want to get out of it, but you can do almost anything you want as long as you have a decent signal to noise. If you have a mouse mice side, you should use a slightly more sensitive uh, probe than if you use red mice sites because the force levels are just lower. If you use a disease model, you may again have to go to a, a more compliant probe so you get better signal to noise for the low force that you'll get and you'll still be able to do the clamping. Uh, okay. Um, Joe, is there any, can you chime in on this as well? I know in previous discussion, you and I, we talked about pre and after loads and in a practical sense, um, how the user would kind of set these or. Yeah, so uh, so we designed the software to make it as easy as possible. Uh, the software determines the min max force, the diastolic systolic forces for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're just entering values based on that in a relative sense. So what percentage, like Michael mentioned, he starts with a 10% preload. Um, you, you just throw those values right into the software and the software takes care of it for you. Okay. Very good. Um, all right, so this, uh, just give me a moment to look through our questions list here. Um, I'm sure this is of interest to, to many online. How about combining different experimental techniques along with work loops simultaneously? I mean, we're on a microscope stage, so, um, but you know, I'm sure there are multiple, uh, yeah, techniques we could add simultaneously. Can, can you guys touch on that for a moment? Yeah, uh, Michael mentioned uh, in Ben's lab that they'd, uh, they'd done confocal. Really any microscope-based technique will work. Um, you know, fluorescence, so like the confocal, any imaging wide field, um, any photometry techniques. Um, it'll also work with patch clamp. Uh, you, have to be, um, you have to be conscious of the fact that you're actually changing the length you're driving, the length of the motor, so you want to put the, the patch needle where there's uh, the cell's most stationary. Mm -hmm. um, and also, of course, contrast-based techniques. Um, you know, one of the limitations of doing tissue is that it's it's hard to get a proper sarcomere shortening measurement. But in single cells, um, you know, that's trivial. So contrast-based techniques like sarcomere shortening are also available. Perfect. Um, Michael, anything to add? or? Oh, as good as I could have given it. Uh. Perfect. Okay. Um, actually, I've got a question from um, Eva. Just she wants clarification on. You showed many graphs, many videos. Um, mm -hmm. But for the actual work loop, is are you your measure? What are you measuring for cell length? Are you measuring a distance between the rods, or um, or are we relating this back to sarcomere length? Um, you know, so the graph of a work loop. What are we really yeah. looking at? You know. So what you're measuring, you're measuring what's called the external work that the myocyte is doing. I mean, there's work that's being done internally, the calcium turnover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the work loops are about the external work that it is doing. So there's only two parameters relevant in this case. That is the force and that is the length change that the motor maze makes. So whenever I show loops, it's the force and the length change the motor makes. Now, I'd like to know the sarcomere length, and that's whenever I put the sarcomere length in the graph, I kind of put it aside. Uh, okay. It would look kind of ugly if I would make uh, four sarcomere length graphs. Uh, yeah. It may look slightly less ugly if I use the cell holders, but, but really then it still would not be appropriate because the external work is the work between the force transducer and the motor. Perfect. Okay. Um, 
And they're actually absolute values, values it's nice. You don't have to argue whether a micron is a micron or whether a micronewton is a micronewton. It, it is what it is. So it's a nice absolute value that you can compare from cell to cell. Perfect. No, I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, we've got a number of users of ion optic systems and, and you know, other uh, systems that have, you know, probably have, um, you know, homegrown as I, as I refer to them. But um, a number of questions kind of just really draw on the question of those that are doing your traditional calcium and contractility measurements. What, what equipment or what needs to be added to take a system of that nature to measuring work as, we, as we've discussed today? So uh, starting with just a basic ion optics calcium contractility system, um, in terms of hardware, you need the ability to attach the myosite, and that's what we call the myostretcher. Mm -hmm. um, be able to, you need the ability to measure force, um, and that's the opti-force, force transducer, and then make fast link changes, um, so the piezo motor as well. Um, we'd also need to upgrade the hardware interface to accommodate the programmable FPGA chip, and then in software, you need to add a new acquisition module to your existing uh, ion wizard core acquisition software. Um, in terms of, of home-built systems, that's kind of a case-by-case -case situation. Um, uh, obviously, you need those those four components, but you might also need a couple other components to make the system go. Um, so, you know, can, can I chime that. in on that? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, th there's one example where people were studying uh, tuberculae muscle strips. Uh, and they wanted to do work loops with it, and they had a they had a they had an Aurora system, which is uh, which has a force transducer that has an analog output. It has a Galva motor that has an analog input. So all they did was connect those to our interface box that contains the FPGA, and they could run the work loops. Uh, okay. So in that sense, you can combine it with uh, with third party components or with existing systems. Oh, that's great. So there is an opportunity to mate. Um, you know, the essential technologies you listed, Michael, earlier that really brought to you to the higher performance work loop um, stage we're at now. Yeah, pro 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 provided that your force measurements are good enough and mm -hmm. that you have a fast enough way to change length. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the, the third party equipment has the appropriate outputs and inputs that you can drive. Sure. The, 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 actually, when it comes to analog and an, out, and an outputs, that's, that's rarely a problem, but yes. Uh, Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for that. And actually, um, yeah, we've come to the the hour point on our session, so it's a perfect time to um, wrap things up. So, uh, I mean, at this point, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to attend our webinar. Uh, we hope you found the information provided valuable. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Michael Helms again for his time today and work leading up to the event. And a big thank you to our webinar sponsor, Ion Optics. Uh, again, the slide deck and recording will be available soon for viewing at InsideScientific.com. Also, a full transcribed report of our Q&A session will be posted in the coming weeks, so look out for an email or two regarding these resources and how you can access them. Um, and then finally, just to mention again, you'll be greeted by a survey following this webinar. Your feedback is extremely important and um, will help us continue to put together meaningful and education events, uh, educational events on, again, topics that um, you're most interested in, so um, we thank you in advance. In closing, uh, have a wonderful day, everybody, and we look forward to having you with us uh, again soon at a future Inside Scientific webinar. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Joe. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Very welcome. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody.